welcome everyone. I'm Patricia Kranz. I'm the executive director of Overseas Press Club. And so uh, we are happy to see a uh, good turnout. And we know everybody here is interested in the topic. Either they were there or very interested. Um, uh, I myself was in Moscow in the 90s, but not, not in Berlin. But so um, experienced the fallout from the fall of the war. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, the, our moderator, Deirdre Dabke, who um, was president of LPC from 2016 to 2018, and uh, is uh, now the executive producer of the Tayboy on WNYC, and um, is so accomplished I can't go into all the details, <laughs> but was <laughs> foreign editor at Chief of Correspondence, foreign editor at Newsweek, and I also worked at Business Week and um, was managing editor of the Daily Beast and worked at Marketplace Radio too. So, um, Deirdre, um, did you work with a lot of the Newsweek people at that time? Uh, I certainly did. And, and, and so, so dear, you take it away. Uh, we're gonna start with a little because I'm the radio and I can't resist. Uh, we're gonna start with a little sound, and then we're gonna go to a video, um, which was created just for us by David Turnley. Uh, it was in photos that he and his brother Peter shot from the time period, from the time period, which uh, I think will be a real treat. So, cue audio, Chad. Do you want to do lights? Thank <laughs> you. 
It was only thirty years ago, but it seems like another lifetime, doesn't it? Um, it really does. And looking at those pictures of faith and hope and optimism makes me sad. But um, that's something we can talk about uh, as we go through our panel. So it was November 9, as you all know, 1989, and the world watched in amazement as East Germans streamed through and over the Berlin Wall to cross into West Berlin. Berliners on both sides of the city celebrating, were celebrating at top of the wall. And this, the collapse of this iconic symbol of East-West divide was not an isolated incident, incident, but the culmination of a series of political upheavals throughout the region that year. Taken together, they marked the beginning of the end of the Soviet Empire and the Cold War. And I guess I would argue the true end to World War II. We could trace the birth of the European Union and actually the current political turmoil in Europe directly to those events. So joining me to discuss all this is a distinguished panel of journalists who are on the ground for this revolution. I know many of you were too, so I'll introduce them. We'll have some group discussion with the panelists, and then we'll open it up to, uh, to the audience so that you can also tell your stories and make your observations about what, how we should think about this 30 years later. Anne Kibrowski, my dear friend, was born in Scotland to Polish parents, moved to the United States as an infant, and has rarely stopped moving south. He spent more than three decades as a foreign correspondent, an editor for Newsweek in Hong Kong, Rome, Bonn, Berlin, Warsaw, and Moscow. During the upheavals of 1989-90, he traveled back frequently to Central and Eastern Europe, reporting for Newsweek and other publications. He's also the author of seven books, most recently, 1941, The Year Germany Lost the War, which you probably could recommend. Yeah. Or even so, well, 
<laughs> Jonathan Hapstein spent 48 years abroad as a foreign correspondent, 22 of them for Business Week, my alma mater as well, uh, where he was posted to South America, Canada, Italy, and Africa. His articles have appeared in U.S. News and World Report, The Nation, The Reporter, Commercial Aviation News, New York News Week, Day, and many, many others. Born and raised in Providence, Rhode Island, like my husband. <laughs> Uh, John is a graduate of Brown University and Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism. He has held a fellowship in international reporting at Columbia and was a lieutenant commander in the U.S. Navy. Thank you for your service. My dear friend Carol is president of the Marshall Project, a nonprofit media organization covering criminal justice in the United States. Founded in 2014, the Marshall Project. Project has published more than a thousand stories with media partners, ranging from the New York Times, Washington Post, to the Jackson, Mississippi, Clarion Ledger. It's a Pulitzer Prize winning story about a rape investigation gone terribly wrong. It was recently made into one of the most popular Netflix, Netflix series of the year. Unbelievable. Carol worked for 20 years as Deputy Director of Human Rights Watch for Media. She covered the fall of communism from Moscow, where she was a correspondent and a bureau chief for Newsweek magazine from 1989 to 1993. And John, you're going to have to help me. Yeah, yeah, became vice president for standards and editor at large for the Associated Press in July 2016, after more than a decade living at international. News Department as international editor, senior managing editor, and vice president for international news. Prior to that, he spent 20 years as a reporter, editor, and correspondent for both AP and the Los Angeles Times. He's worked in more than 70, that's amazing, countries, including postings to Warsaw, Johannesburg, Cairo, Moscow, Baghdad, and London. So thank you very much to our panel, and thank you very much to our audience for joining us. And I'm going to start with you. There's a modern misconception, I think, that the that the wall um, that when the wall between East and West Berlin was breached, that led directly to the collapse of communism. But it's a bit more complicated than that. Uh, can you give us the context of what happened in 1989 and then years before and after? Sure. Uh, do I have to Okay. My technical skills. Okay. All right. Yes. Thanks. Uh, the quick, I mean, as most of you know, certainly by the 80s, the failures of that system in the Soviet Union and the whole what was called the Soviet bloc were so evident to everyone, yet there was this feeling of what's, what's ever going to change. Uh, I remind you, I happen to be living in West Germany, based in Bonn in 87, when Reagan made that famous speech, Mr. Gorbachev tear down this wall. And I remember when it was made, you could almost hear the snickers of many people in Bonn and elsewhere saying, you know, who is this crazy American thinking that the wall can fall? Uh, and even the activists in, in Eastern Europe, uh, in solidarity, Charter 77, and so forth, well, yeah, they they did not they weren't work they weren't working on the assumption that everything was going to change that quickly. But what had happened in Greece was, you know, of course, there were the failed violent revolutions like the Hungarian Revolution. There was the the and uh, workers' protests in East Berlin in the fifties, and then uh, shipyard protests in the late day, in the early seventies in Poland. There have been all these attempts to change, and everyone has been suppressed either by Soviet tanks or by local tanks and local local police. And by the 80s, there were increasing number of movements that were challenging the system from within, ground up for solidarity in Poland. It was inspired in part by John Paul, the election of a Polish Pope. Uh, you had Ronald Reagan challenging the Soviet Empire as never before. And then later you have Gorbachev comes on the scene. And this is, I'm sure Carol will get to this, the whole question of what was Gorbachev's vision. I brief my take is that he thought you could reform and tinker with the system, but save it. And then and I think he helped destroy it by trying to save it that way. But 
by 89, uh, I think you have, I, I, I compare this a little bit to like a five-act play. Act one is in Poland. Poland, everything has been, there has been martial law in the beginning of the 80s. The, the, the attempts to just keep suppressing solidarity, can get, get the economy going, all of that failed. The shortages of the system are not good to believe. Shortages of everything, food stamps, food stuffs, the, the most basic commodities, the failures of the system were evident. And the demoralization was evident. And I remember talking to one of the Politburo members later who said, we were, we were a bit like in, in a situation where you're in an airplane and one en engine goes out, then another engine, and pretty soon all the engines are out, the landing rear is stuck. And we're trying to land this damn plane. And they decided that at that point, we'll negotiate with solidarity, which would be outlawed, and try to try to eliminate. And but they thought, oh, we have this clever thing. We we we'll, we'll we'll arrange a deal where we'll allow them to contest a minority of the seats in parliament so they'll feel good. But of course, we'll retain the majority. Well, as, as the polls later said, this was trying to remain a bit pregnant. It didn't work out <laughs> because once you allow partly free elections, which solidarity just wiped the communists uh, off the map, they left the electoral map, they won everything. Even the so called sister parties of the Communist Party defected, they realized their careers were over if they didn't jump. And pretty soon in Parliament, you had a solidarity majority, the first non communist government in Eastern Europe. That, that it, the effect on the region was huge. That, that was the, 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 the elections were in June. June. Yeah. The government, government was formed. Yeah, took a while to form the government. The communist party to form a government first and failed. So imagine, so what is the next step? Act two, I think is Hungary next door. Hungary, the Hungarians know what the Hungarian Communist Party always prided itself to be more reform-minded and a little bit more better in economic management. And it was true, but they were being left behind. So what do they do? They take the symbolic step of taking down the Iron Curtain between Hungary and Austria, which means actually cutting the barbed wire out of the foreign minister of both countries doing it. What people forget is that Hungarians had been had been allowed more leeway, and they were they were allowed to cross into Austria anyway. But what this meant was that East Germans who were trapped within what was called the socialist bloc uh, could go to Hungary. That they could never not travel to the West, but they could go to Hungary, and then they could go go right across the border. And and suddenly, like. They suck them out of the population from East Germany. The East Germans were furious. They had, but uh, the Hungarians were not, didn't want to be seen as the folks who were bucking the trend towards the moral system. So that happens. Then, of course, there's the Berlin Wall, where again, once all those people start leaving, the East German authorities are in total panic. And almost by accident, they announced there's free travel, and everyone says, oh yeah, okay, I'm out of here. <laughs> and that, that was November 9th in very simplified form. Act 4 happens in Czechoslovakia and Romania. In December, Czechoslovakia, the Velvet Revolution, Václav Havel, the, the, the dissidents there were a much smaller movement in solidarity. But the outburst of, of the psychological barriers have been stopped. The outburst of activism reached there. They toppled the Czech regime and Romania. And here, John and, and John Tapia Bure can tell you much more about it. The one violent revolution takes place in Romania in December. And then finally, the, and then in the Soviet Union, I'd say, was Act 5. It's, it's, it's amazing. But one thing I just make one more remark about this. The psychological transformation is huge. And for me, you know, there's that one active anecdote that captures it. After the Polish elections, these solidarity activists who had been meeting secretly in the mountains with some of the Czech activists decided to go uh, as parliamentarians now suddenly to, to Prague and to visit Havel and others. And Havel invites them, this group of uh, Polish parliament, newfound parliamentarians, to his country house and then this 
being in Czechoslovakia, there's a lot of long bitter, a lot of beer flows. And at a certain point, so if people are getting rest to say, uh, uh, you know, we got, we got to, you know, relieve ourselves somehow. And he says, I have an idea. You see outside our, our, our house, all those cameras pointed in. We're going to go relieve ourselves right there. And all these guys marched out and, and, and relieved themselves from the cameras. At that point, the communist system is clearly not seen as the threat. Of course. Wow. <laughs> John A., you were in Berlin on November 9th. Can you describe for us what that was like um, and how people reacted? It's amazing. The, the sense of euphoria was, was, was intense. Uh, I arrived in the evening and went promptly to the wall. They were that's your place. Yeah, you're on. Yeah, yeah no. Yeah. I arrived in the evening and went promptly to the wall. There were parties everywhere. Uh, ad hoc groups, choirs, church groups, uh, drinkers. Uh, everything, and you can hear the sound on the other side of the wall of these German military engineers uh, crossing what was the death strip, removing the mines, removing the inner curtain wall, and clearing a path to what happens hot stamp of glass, which was the first to be open, if I remember correctly. Uh, and the, uh, the sense of this was amazing. The next day, uh, people again were everywhere, they were climbing the wall. Eventually, the Berlin and the fire brigade put trucks and dump trucks nose to nose so the people actually wouldn't get hurt. There was saws, uh, uh, there was a risk of uh, setting off landmines, uh, all kinds of, uh, of uh, possibilities uh, appeared. And then I drove across, remember, it was still the DDR, uh, but the holsters in the DDR border police were empty, or there were no clips in the pistols. The lineup of cars coming the other way was huge. I think something incredible, 800,000 East Germans in Berlin has crossed in that first 24 hours. And by the way, 20,000 didn't go back. Uh, they stayed right then and there. Uh, uh, the uh, the uh, sense of this was intense. Uh, there were East Germans kissing the American military police at the checkpoint charge. <laughs> <laughs> Not something that normally would happen in anyone's world, but this time it did. Uh, and it was an exciting time, it really was. There were East Germans who thought we'd be able to preserve this, that we like, the, uh, the subsidized housing, the, what they thought was better medical care, which in turn wasn't really true anymore. Uh, but again, they were relics of history. History overcame everything and just moved forward. What was life in East Berlin like in 1989? I mean, was there food? Was there medicine? What was the situation with the people who lived there? Streets were empty. Uh, nobody went out at night. Uh, it was fascinating to cross from one side to the other. Even after the wall was open, it was still a desolate, desolate urban environment on the far side. Uh, I don't know what the food situation was, uh, but I can tell you that the bars on the Western side were crowded. And interestingly enough, what did the East Germans head for first? Uh, fruit stands, they loaded up in bananas. Uh, sweets, uh, I remember my translator, I had high school German, but I couldn't rely on it for sophisticated uh, interviews. My translator wanted gummy bears. <laughs> but she also, by the way, was a fan of, uh, of uh, hillbilly music. And I had to tell <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 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 the automobile showrooms were jammed. It was a very interesting time. Well, and the sex shops. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I left that out. Yes. <laughs> Long lines from the sex shops. <laughs> John D., moving forward a little bit, you were shot uh, while covering the revolution in Romania after the wall fell. Why was that? After a relatively peaceful event that had happened all across Eastern Europe, how does Romania such a platform? I think Romania was the most uh, repressive in, in an ironic way because uh, Ceausescu uh, 
you know, held himself up as a, um, as a bridge between East and West. And yet he ran the most uh, repressive uh, dictatorship in the Eastern Bloc, and he built these fabulous buildings for himself that really starved and deprived the people who were horribly cut off from, uh, from the West. And uh, I think he was determined to hold on to power and uh, and uh, was willing to use uh, uh, firepower to do it, whereas the other uh, leaders, I think, saw the, the writing of the whole um, it didn't end well for him, did it? <laughs> no, it didn't end well for him. It didn't end well for John and me. <laughs> yeah. we, we were two guys named John who lived on the same block in Warsaw. We were both in Himeshwara on the same Saturday night, and we were both shot, but we weren't together. <laughs> wow. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, there was just a, a tremendous uh, uh, isolation from the rest of the world. Uh, I remember going through checkpoints uh, before I got shot, and uh, uh, people had never seen a computer. People had uh, people were like searching through apples, thinking there might be monitoring devices inside of them. It, it, it was just some bizarre mass hysteria was going on at that time. Carol, there's a kind of an odd China connection to the fall of the law. Um, you talked about it when we did a Tiananmen event not too long ago. Can you talk to us about uh, Mikhail Gorbachev and his trip to Beijing and how that fit into this whole story? Yeah, I had an interesting perspective on 1989 covering Tiananmen as well as the Soviet Union because I was based in Moscow for this weekend. Um, I think people forget that one of the reasons the student demonstrations in China went on so long is that they were waiting for Gorbachev to come and they wanted to speak to Gorbachev and they wanted to speak to the international media and say, we want Bosnians, we want to strike, but we don't have those things in China. And, um, you know, I, mean, I, was a, I was a young correspondent and, um, you know, what happened in Tiananmen was very uh, tragic and very, uh, just a difficult emotion to live through. And uh, gave me a different perspective when I went back to Moscow, which is where I was based, about what could happen there. And I think when we look at beautiful photo slideshows and reflect from the vantage point of 30 years on, we may have a feeling of inevitability, which we did not feel at the time, or I did not feel at the time. And I, just because it's more fun to have a panel where people could fight, you know, I would love to I would love to fight this on this panel about whether it was inevitable. I mean, it was inevitable that communism collapsed. You can't imagine the clunky old Soviet Union competing with Silicon Valley, right? There was something just time bound about that, about the very idea of a world capital like Berlin being permanently divided by a wall. It's insane in retrospect, but it was not inevitable. That communism fell in 1989, and the reason that it did is that Gorbachev was unwilling to use force, and don't show me was. And that is, I believe, the critical difference. And had Gorbachev used force, things could have been different in Eastern Europe and Soviet Union for a long time. Maybe not up until today, but for a long time. Are those events connected? Was Gorbachev influenced by what he saw in Beijing? I'm sure Gorbachev, he was an emotional person, and I'm, yes, he was certainly influenced by what he saw in Beijing. You know, I think when you ask yourself why did one situation turn out so differently from another, um, um, I don't mean to get into a tall story, but you know, <laughs> large, large groups of people in history, right? All those people on Taiwan's part of history, all those people that we were, you know, outside the Kremlin, you know, Red Square, with all the people demonstrating, I mean, all of that mattered, right? And yet, and yet, at the end of the day, the, the dictator makes decisions based on a very shrink wrapped set of advisors that are close to him. And Deng Xiaoping deciding to fire on students, I think, 
had a lot to do with who you know, Lee Pong, who was immediately around him, you know, and jobs around how he was in North Korea, there's a lot of Chinese history here that I won't go into, but he had at his elbow people who advised him to be tough. And Gorbachev had at his elbow like Rensa. And I uh, you know I'm all yeah, uh, people who advised him not to shoot, and, and as much as world history is moved by these big, big events and, and, and public pressure, it may also be determined, funnily enough, by their response. Maybe it doesn't include at uh, a national scale, things are kind of different. I know Andy and, yes, I know Andy and John both want to comment on this uh, topic as well. Go ahead. Um, we'll I think that's a very perceptive point about the willingness to use force uh, and the unwillingness to use force. What happened in Berlin uh, that night, uh, the day before, there had been a, uh, a party conference at the highest level, and they had announced that uh, they decided that the wall would be open to bid. That night, the press secretary said it would be, because he hadn't been briefed probably, that it would be opened immediately. And suddenly there were huge crowds at the wall, and the East German border guards panicked. They didn't know what to do, and they were told, let them through. And that's exactly what happened. They didn't use force, unlike Tiananmen Square and the World War yeah, I, I think I totally agree with you that the individuals here, the, the activists and the leaders, were, were critical. In terms of Gorbachev's role, I, 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 in 95, I spent a few days with him when he was young. No one was paying much attention to him. And we talked about these things. And what struck me was that he, even then, he believed he could have saved the Soviet Union. He really believed, in terms of, at first he believed, maybe this, this party no longer believed, but at first he believed that, there were, that he had sprinkled kind of many Gorbachevs around Eastern Europe, they would have stayed in power. There are people who, Allow, allow a little bit more dissent, a little more economic experimentation, and the Eastern Europeans would be fine. What he didn't realize is if you remove the threat of Soviet tanks, this whole place was going to go. Uh, to his credit, he then did not roll in the tanks, as, as your point, that another leader probably would have. But the same thing was true within the Soviet Union. And what he didn't realize, I think, was the degree to which all those attempts at using force and succeeded provisionally for a while and kept that whole empire together had led to a situation where nobody believed, uh, very few people believed anymore that there was kind of a reform socialism that you could preserve. I, I remember in the, you know, I remember the Dubček era in Czechoslovakia and so forth, there were lots of people, even after the tanks rolled, said, well, if only we reform the system, we don't really have to go with a full democratic system, full capitalist system. <laughs> I remember in 88, I was going to some protests in Poland, and I talked to students, and I said, what do you think about this idea, can the system still be reformed? And he said, you know, well, this is, think of it this way, the relationship between democracy and socialist democracy is the same is the same as between a chair and an elected chair. <laughs> We're not sitting in that chair anymore. And they really wanted to change the system. And a lot of people didn't understand that or believe that, including in the West, even though they weren't sure that it would happen any, anywhere that quickly. John D, can we talk a little bit about the reaction of the West um, and Western leaders to the fall of the wall? The Americans, the French, the English, the West Germans, even, were kind of caught off guard by how quickly this happened. And their response was something they had to sort of dream up on the fly. How good a job do you think they did? Well, yes, I think they were caught off guard. I think at first the idea that Germany would be. Uh, it was uh, frightening. They, they were a little upset of uh, upsetting the stability that had kept the peace, more or less, since the end of World War II. So they wanted to proceed very cautiously. Um, but uh, gradually, I think there was also a sense of, uh, of uh, triumph, victory in the West, and that. Uh, the ideals of uh, liberal democracy and free markets 
uh, or what everyone wanted. And, uh, and I think, uh, you know, through, as it gradually became more clear what the people of Eastern Europe wanted to be, which was European, uh, the logic of maintaining uh, a divided Germany and a divided uh, Europe uh, evaporated. Uh, and then it just became a matter of working out uh, the mechanics with Moscow. Andy, tell me about uh, George Bush and James Baker. They ran foreign policy for the United States at the time. Um, and history treats them rather well uh, in how they dealt with the issue. Yeah. Well, let me just add one PS first on Reagan before Reagan Bush. Yeah, I remember in 87, I was back living in Germany and is now in Berlin, not long. And on the 10th anniversary of that famous speech of Mr. Gorbachev carried down this wall, I remember I was driving to work and I had some German pop music station on. And, and they interrupted, they ran that clip, and they said, remember 10 years ago, we all kind of laughed at this. He knew something we didn't know. So Reagan did begin to get recognition for having challenged, but Bush and Baker were, given, were tremendously skillful in handling the whole issue, the relationship with Gorbachev, the relationship with Cole, the relationship with Maggie Thatcher, the French, and saying, and not Trump being, there were some people who really were criticizing, why isn't Bush celebrating more about these triumphs? And he was the chicken fields. Yeah, the chicken fields. Yeah, all Tell that. Us the chicken fields. Yeah. 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 You went to the Bush was famously non celebratory of the idea of independence for the Republicans. So yeah. 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 And, uh, and he did not want to you know, sort of push it in you know, as a defeat for Gorbachev and sort of bringing him in, getting him to accept more and more as the inevitable. Uh, and, and and I think that was that was quite a balancing act. Uh, it would have been hard to I, I imagine the social media age if he had been as restrained. <laughs> no, he would have been pummeled by everybody. Uh, but in the end, I think he gained the respect, even <coughs> if Gorbachev later felt well, he got kind of outmaneuvered on some things and so forth. But he, they felt that they were treated generally respectfully. Uh, and overcome the real trepidations on uh, about German unification on both sides. But remember, it's German unification plus German NATO membership, mm -hmm. keeping Germany firmly in the West, the United Germany, because it was always the fear you know, during the Cold War is one day the Soviets are going to appeal to Germans. Let's you guys can unite, but you'll be neutral, which of course would be under. Yeah, it's under the shadow of the Soviet Union, right? It was done, maintained in these principles that it will be, if, if, if a united Germany wants to be a part of NATO, it will be part of NATO. This is not Moscow's decision, but done very politely. Okay. Here's my Gorbachev story. Ten years later, almost the day, uh, I was, I went to labor. I was nine months pregnant, was in the delivery room at, at, at uh, where was it, Jerome? Uh, <laughs> Lennox Hill Hospital. And I was closed, I worked for music at the time, and I was closing a story while I was in labor uh, that had been written by Gorbachev. And in that story, he was arguing about how his point of view had, was correct, and that 10 years on, uh, things would have been a lot better if he had been allowed to prevail. So I think he's never changed his mind about that. Uh, as a former economics correspondent, I think, John, you can give us some insight into how all of these events led inevitably to the rise of the European Union, both politically and economically. Um, can you trace back that for us, give us a little insight into how that happened? Sure. Again, it was a major, a, a life-transforming event of all coming down. Uh, one comment about Baker and Bush, they were genuine uh, leaders in this process. Uh, Margaret Thatcher had dug in her heels. She was carrying around in her handbag 
her famous handbag, uh, a map of the 1937 German borders. And as late as four months after the wall had come down, she was lobbying at checkers to the French and to anyone else who would listen against German unification. Uh, she was genuinely alarmed about it. Uh, she was, I would say, more against it than even the French who had major doubts. Uh, but just yeah. interject another famous quote. I like Germany so much it's just good to have two of them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was Maddie? That was Maddie. <laughs> and Maddie, everybody in sight. The, uh, the next step, very quickly, uh, the European Union enlarged. It took in the former East and uh, many of the Eastern states rather quickly. Uh, they lined up. And, and over time, what you've seen is a whole shift eastward, somewhat to the dismay of the original core countries. Uh, and now with Britain, I'm jumping ahead of course, but with Britain leaving one way or another, the Brexit situation, the, the uh, focus has shifted to Berlin. Germany and the Deutsche Mark are now the winners of the last half century. The Euro is a Deutsche Mark in disguise. Uh, the, with Britain not pulling things, or shall I say, westward, the center of Europe is Berlin. It's a very interesting phenomenon. Germany has been very shy about taking the lead until recently in the European Commission and the European Union. Not anymore. John, do you want to add something? We'll see Well, I, I do think that um, idea of uh, that powerful United Germany would be a threat to its neighbors again. Uh, also existed somewhere in the East, and uh, I give uh, Helen Cole uh, credit for uh, assuaging those feelings, and um, and also Germany has shown restraint in its, in its foreign policy. Uh, and I think do think we should receive interesting challenges now when when Russia is is clearly uh, internationally. Becoming uh, more uh, aggressive and expensive, and, uh, and we have um, very uh, far right parties emerging um, in, uh, in parts of Eastern Europe and also uh, a local minority in Germany. Um, you know, where will that stability come in the future, especially after Britain leaves? Carol, that brings me to you. Um, I want to ask you about Russia and U.S. relations today uh, and how Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin's relationship really, uh, in some ways, takes us back to those days, right before the fall and the patriarchy that I know you were very interested in. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's sort of a slightly different point, but I want to make it to your mind. Um, I just want to throw out there for everyone's consideration the idea that actually we lost the Cold War. That we lost it together. And that we lost it because uh, we are we bankrupted our country building what I now rightly like call the military industrial complex, which was not dismantled in the wake of the end of the Cold War. Um, but not only that, we um, allowed ourselves a kind of triumphalism about the victory of our system, which embedded certain things that have proved to be not so helpful for our country. And you know what Andy just said about he was a chair and a socialist chair and a social chair and electric chair and the, the notion of any of the ideas of the left about universal health care and about universal education and about bridling capitalism rather than allowing it to be unbridled. Those were all discredited. And, and um, you know, the, the idea that Reagan was the great hero of the Cold War who brought down the wall, whereas I, you know, I believe that Gorbachev was the hero of the Cold War who, who more than any other historical figure was responsible for the peaceful end of the Eastern Bloc. Um, but that's not a narrative that that dominates in our country, and I think to our detriment. And I think the yeah, in the language of, of uh, today's youths, you know, it, it reinforces the white patriarchy 
Um, and I, I mean that as well. I do love to be white gentlemen that I'm on the panel with, but I think they're all covering a system that was so sure of its own rightness uh, that it became unwilling to change and to conserve many of the social programs that might have made American capitalism a little bit less cool. And I think this has not been good for our country to think of ourselves as the victor in the Cold War. And Gorbachev was a hero because he didn't send the tanks into the streets. Is that no, the moment? Gorbachev was a hero because he was being glorious and he talked too much and he was so limited in so many ways and so blind. And as you say, you know, he thought he could perform things that he could perform. There's so many things he didn't understand. Um, I hate to call him a hero, but he, he was um, he was a man who did not use violence, and that was the signature achievement of his era. And I just had, you know, I think you, I sort of always opposed the idea of sort of identifying one person as the, the hero of the era. I mean, I think it, it is, if, if you're, I think, first of all, for me, a lot of the heroes are the folks who started those movements. Uh, when we saw their HR 77s and on the Soviet dissidents. Uh, the democratic opposition in Hungary, all that put pressure on the system. JP2. Excuse me? JP2. JP2, absolutely. Yes, the Polish vote. Yes, this, I, I think it's no accident that when he was elected in 78, solidarity really took off shortly thereafter. Uh, but, and he didn't have to be overtly political to do that, just to say, you have to speak the truth because suburbs have been up. Uh, but uh, in terms of the major players, I think it is a combination of uh, Reagan, Gorbachev, Thatcher, and John Paul. All of them played separate roles. And I don't think one has to be yet and how they understood their roles. But I, I, I do give Reagan a lot of credit for his instincts and then also how he dealt with Knight and Thatcher. And, 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 and by the way, it's interesting the different reactions. I remember being in Poland in 1988 again. And talking to solidarity activists, and this was a time when people were really tired. Reagan was still president, and people were really, really tired of him for domestic reasons in the States. And the most frequent question I had is, can't he run for a third term? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they, yeah. No, and, I remember we came up like the first real friend I knew was a dean of his Russian journalist who worked for the UFT magazine, yes. which you will remember, Andy. And I remember him saying to me, so remember when Reagan? Said that thing about the evil empire, and I like, you know, I'm thinking that they were like, oh, I'm going to have to be sorry. I was like, no, 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 that was the best thing in my life. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very seriously. I get the sense that um, our audience would like to jump in here. We have some very distinguished journalists who are here uh, John and Rose Brady, Steve Strasser, Charles Jensen. Yeah, uh, I'd really love to hear your thoughts and your observations. I just, want, I just wanted to ask a quick follow up for Carol and what Andy um, I was wondering how you view the events of Lithuania in 91 in your context of Gorbachev. I was wondering how you view the events of Lithuania in 91 in the context of Gorbachev. Do you want to shoot as an aberration? Or yeah. 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 Ye
And I had just been told a Russian idiom that that was like sending the goat into the garden. <laughs> so I filled with the, you know, my newfound idiom, I said in Russian, well, that's like Gorbachev sending the goat into the Sad, the sad instead of the road. Like I used to walk with the garden. And when the broadcast was over, the door of the studio first opened, and the, tech, the technical crew all fell in the studio laughing. I was stopped in the street the next day. You're the girls that could go into the sod. You know, Gorbachev did make some main efforts to. Um, and, and, and I'm not sure that how much he was in control of a decision. I mean, you, you remember those days where, was, where we struggled to know who's really wanting things here and how much they were. Okay. It'd be great if you would introduce yourself. Great, Mr. Witt. I was covering a lot of that stuff at the Times along with. You. Back then, I'd just like to say something about the idea of inevitability, which was addressed, you know, was it inevitable to involve the trial? My reaction, maybe yours, somewhere, back when it happened, it's happening you know, in Germany, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Hungary, and so on, was God, this is great. You know, the world's going to change for the better, and all these places are going to become democracies. And uh, you know, look what's happened instead. Not just there. You know, to some extent, either. white supremacy, uh, racism, and some of it, of course, is caused by a huge influx of uh, right. refugees into Europe and back to the collapse of Syria. But, uh, what do you think? I mean, uh, what went wrong besides that? Why didn't the world turn out to be a better place after what happened in 1989? It was what, you know, when we were looking at those photos, and I said, it's, 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 it's so naive. You know, we just seem so naive and, I don't know, hopeful, and now we don't. So, go ahead. Pew Research just did it. Fascinating study of the attitudes in Eastern Europe towards uh, unification 30 years on. And apparently, the one item that they didn't highlight, but that came up over and over in all the former East Bloc countries was they wanted a fair justice system. Some countries wanted a little more free press, public opinion here and there wanted uh, more political opposition. But over and over, a fair judiciary seemed to be. A real goal that hasn't been achieved, and that's a long way to go. I was just I was going to say that I think you know, for many people, life uh, obviously did get much better. People could travel, their standards were really improved. But um, the uh, there's so many people, especially in the countryside, were left behind, uh, and it became very easy. I think for uh, you know. Uh, the political parties that had been part of the ruling structure before to see that exploiting differences within their own society would be their, their wrong back to power. And so you had, um, so I, I think it's just you know, an, an old demagogue's trip to, uh, to exploit people, exploit uh, their disappointments, and, and, and come back in. And Cola, you know. Um, of course, the uh, the uh, uh, justice and, and law law and justice party is uh, harking back to um, religious fervor and, and and again exploiting the difference between religious poles and, and uh, secular poles and just keep pushing these divisive issues, just like we're seeing in our own country. Politicians pushing these divisive issues. I also suspect the hand of Putin in a lot of this. Uh, 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 stirring up trouble, making people distrust each other, making people distrust immigrants. But of course, if you travel in these countries before, they're, they're tremendously improved materially. And so many people who we knew had very limited lives, limited ability to travel, limited 
ability to do the kind of work they wanted to do, a limited ability to get education, have had those opportunities, and they some of them stayed home, some of them spread all over the world. So I think it's a, it's a mix, uh, but I think what we really have today is, is a problem of demagoguery. I would really like to put Putin in context in this discussion. Would you like to do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a short one. Well, let me let me just uh, right on. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you know, I first of all, I think that I think the end of the Cold War was a very positive development. We had overinflated expectations. Uh, I, I was based in Warsaw in the early. I came back. It changed permanently to reopen our zero and the first half part of the 90s. And in 95, I left and New Zealand wanted to close the bureau now. Closing bureaus is something we are all familiar with, but it wasn't just budget reasons. It was, I tell people who say, How can we close the Warsaw Bureau? We're so important. Say, Well, you become a normal, boring country. Oh, okay. And that was true. You should take that as a compliment. And it is for all the problems that you have in Poland or Hungary or Slovakia that travel around, that keep traveling around. These countries are transformed in a way that's phenomenal. One small statistic in 89, Poland, I think they calculated the, the average GDP per, uh, per person per capita was about 25% of the standard of living of Germany. Today, it's about 60%. That is a huge change, and Germany has continued to grow. Uh, and you know, there are functioning institutions, there is dissent, there's press, there are all sorts of uh, pressures and, and more, but, but, but it is, you know, compared to what it was, it, it, and let's not lose perspective on that. And then in terms of Putin, just the one thing, I think yeah, Putin, yeah, what he, what he is, what he's doing, we, we all know it became apparent pretty early. Uh, uh, and it was, I remember going back to Moscow in uh, just when he became president. And I remember going in to see one of his, 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 his aides. And he said, Oh, Mr. Nagorski, I remember you. You were kicked out of the Soviet Union. And I remember reading your articles in Newsweek then. I was a student at MDU, the Moscow, Moscow University. I said, well, that's interesting. I didn't know Newsweek, you know, students at MDU had subscriptions to Newsweek. He said, oh, I was working for the KGB then already. <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly it became a bad, you know, a bad surprise. You were the smart ones. And, you know, that all. But I also caution, you know, everything that goes wrong or you think is going wrong. It reminds me a little bit, I remember at one point, just after uh, the collapse of the Soviet system in the early 90, late 91, early 92, I found myself talking to the, <coughs> to the number two guy to Vladimir Zhirinovsky, some of you remember him, the flaming nationalist. He said, and I was there, and I think there was a correspondent from the Philadelphia Inquirer, and he, we just happened to meet up and he said, I have to congratulate you and George Bush. So talking about Bush Sr. I said, for what? Oh, the way when he was the CIA director, he orchestrated the collapse of the Soviet Union. He planned it all out. I said, well, I'd like to think the CIA was that brilliant, but I have my doubts. I think we're in a little danger here in this country of doing the same thing. Everything, you know, every, you know last election, it was all Putin. I mean, whatever you think of the candidates, this is not all Putin. Let's have a little bit more and examine ourselves and you know and, and, and deal with the situation as is. You know, the fact that people try to meddle in the net and, and the Russians, as in the past, are trying to do compromise, uh, compromising material or disinformation. The, the means have changed, but the but the methods are not that that revolutionary. Are there other questions? In the background. So I'm not quite ready to stop mourning that, oh, I'm sorry, um, that moment of optimism. That's what I want to ask about. I'm to Aubrey Gray. I was 19 in 89. I was a journalism student um, at Syracuse, studying in London. 
So my flatmates and I have long felt out in cheap way. We went right there and what we thought we were going to do, of course, to our professor, but we did. And we filled our pockets with pieces of the wall. I have some too. Right? And then <laughs> we went to a West Berlin um, dance club, which you do in your 19, and the lasers were like me fingertips. And I have to say, I don't ever remember a crowd um, that was more joyful. And I've been in a lot of crowds since then. Of course, um, then that night, there was such a sense of we're actually going to see world peace. You know, there's going to be nothing left to report on. It's like the poll tax riots in London, you know. And then right after we got home, just a couple months later, Mandela was free. And it was such a moment. It was like the world is finally getting it. I mean, that was that sense we had. And of course, part of that was probably just youth and optimism that. Um, I don't remember another time in my entire lifetime so far where so many people were hopeful about humanity sort of like, you know, evolving a bit. Um, so I'm really hearing you right now and just wanted to not quite be the guest. Yeah. And I'd love hearing your thoughts about that moment and attending that. Do you think influence Mandela's release too? I'd love to hear the connection. That's a very good question. The only other night I could think of would be November 2012. But go ahead, Carol. Uh, yeah, I think if you've been in Grand Park in November of 2008, that was a, that was a very 2009. Sorry, I, I was not there myself, but people I know who were there felt that the world had changed on its axis and that things were yeah. But I don't want to make too much of it and start us all going. Um, I, I, you know, I, I went from journalism to the Human Rights Watch. And um, the period in the 90s, and you know, George Packer's written about this in his biography of Dick Holbrook and the feeling that American power could be used for good, um, that we could intervene and write wrongs, was relatively short lived. And of course, you know, September 11th, I think, uh, and the use of American power in Iraq for ends that turned out to be not so good. Really, sort of put an end to that illusion. Um, I think you, know, you just mentioned the election of John Kennedy. You know, there, I, you know, I think part of the reason, maybe I don't want to speak for everyone, but for some of us, part of the reason that we're here is that we're all foreign correspondents, and 1989 was the high water mark of foreign correspondence in my lifetime. And a music magazine devoted pages and pages and pages to foreign wars. And that was not the case only a few years later. So if you were a foreign correspondent, that was the year, and these were the stories. And I know there are people here who covered Vietnam, and I don't want to say these were the only stories, but this was an incredible time. And if you're the overseas press club, <laughs> we, we want to gather together and remark on that. You know, it, it doesn't mean that there aren't other moments of public joy, and, and I think that moment in Grand Park in Chicago in 2008 was one of them, and I refuse to believe that we won't experience other moments of joy. I just love the thought about that moment of joy, having moved to Poland, right? I've been in and out of Poland for years, having moved to Poland right after that 89 election and the new government trying to institute reforms. It was amazing to me how quickly people right in the area to, okay, that jubilation sort of dissipated and suddenly saying, oh, great, the stores are full of goods now, but we can't afford them. Yeah. You know, or, you know, any number of things. <laughs> and you realize there's a different set of problems and challenges. And that's normal, you know, on everyday life, you, you know, you focus on the immediate and that, that euphoria could not last. We have time for one more, I think. Okay. Now, so why don't we start here? I'm sorry, I'm trying to speak, but I just wanted to point out that also there's a feeling, there's a feeling since that he threw money at anything at work. Berlin has transferred, uh, if I remember correctly, $2 trillion to 16 million Aussies in East Germany. Uh, were mostly elderly males nowadays. That's about $150,000 per capita. Mm -hmm. And what we've seen in a modern democratic world where people express their opinions is the rise of both the left, which resurged, and the right in East Germany. Whether or not that's a worry, I don't know. 
that is an interesting phenomenon and it's one we should think about. Okay, um, I just wanted to say I was in the living life of Walter Bow, having arrived there only the day before, and a cross check from Charlie with the first East journey to cross that check check and we can prove this to you if you've got time to drink several bottles of wine. <laughs> <laughs> but what was interesting was I, you know, I hadn't spoken to my colleagues in West Berlin all day, but you couldn't. And I finally called somebody from this video that I found, um, because of course we didn't have cell phones, and just screamed at my colleagues. It's what I just did. I cross checked from Charlie with the first piece journal to cross. Then I got a cab to the process with them. And this cab was driven by a typical West Berlin guy from Hamburg who was living in West Berlin to avoid the draft. And he said, Well, I'm leaving immediately. Now they'll come all those Easterners and they'll want their beer and their bananas and their virtue and their money. And I thought, how cynical and cruel this guy was. Boy, was he right. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not only he, but certainly people like Putin were right on the money too, in that they understood very immediately that a price could be put, a number could be attached to what this would all mean. And I think by leaving it as Craig so seriously asked to the forces of capitalism, we had great faith in that, but we forgot to take care. We forgot, as you said, to introduce social welfare to the plant. We forgot that there were different ways. And we have only ourselves to blame for that, unfortunately. Well, we threw the baby out with that water, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, just as the communists did when they came to power. Exactly right. Of course. Uh, I'm sorry I missed track of this fascinating panel discussion. But looking at the world today, I wonder whether you think that there are any legacies or messages, particularly for countries in the Middle East, all those mainly dictatorships and also a lot of the authoritarian governments in Africa? That's a great question. Who wants to tackle that? Carol, I think you do. I still believe that the meaning of God is human rights. I still believe that God is an enemy and a force for humankind. I believe that people they want they want freedom, they want they want truth, they want functioning justice systems, they want fairness. They define that differently, of course, in different cultures. But it, I, I believe it is universal truth and universal value. It's extremely about in our current times, but it's a light that doesn't go out. And that is proven by decades of misery in Eastern Europe, that you know, darkness did come to light. And I would also say, to Craig's point, that despite its uh, historical value and its um, sense of permanence, it's also fragile and when not upheld and protected and fought for, it does die. And the you know history of our civilization is, is is up and down and back and forth according to how much we care about it and we fight for these ideas. So it, it's it's a dark time right now in many parts of the planet, including in this country. And that doesn't mean it will be forever, but there's no inevitability to the light if uh, we don't actually make an effort. I just add a quick to your question on for African dictators for any dictators. I mean, the, the most relevant uh, think, example for them is the one that John and John experienced. That was Romania. The yeah, harder you point. repress that society, the more it's going to explode in your face. So uh, if you don't, if you think you're going to hold on forever, I went to one of I think Chuck Jessica's last party conference. It was you know straight out of 1984, and then a few months later, he would be in both and his lovely wife were were dead. Uh, and so uh, this is uh, so yeah, <laughs> uh, a great scholar and scientist. Just ask the orphans. But uh, so that's 
that is a lesson I think that you, you really push to have you, 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 you know, really you know, human rights and there's no nothing like that. And uh, and, and you paid a price. Last word goes to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm coming, Evelyn. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Evelyn Leopold. I've always had a love hate relationship with Germany, being a child of German refugees. And I was in Rome, as you were, and then in Berlin. And I, like a lot of lady, I kept coming back to Berlin to visit people. And I get the feeling I had the suitcase there. And uh, after the war fell, I, I was in New York at that point, but I, I then went to Berlin a few months later. And I knew a lot of East Germans because I had co authored a book on East German, Montreal. And I went and uh, spoke to them, and the dark side started coming out. Um, people were talking about factories that were in competition with West German factories being shut down, of uh, college professors uh, lining up to decide which. Jobs that one of the to university and others have, uh, well, it went on. I mean, there was a whole list of it. And I was staying in a flat with a toy hunter. And toy hunter was the people who did the unification. He was like, I'm so glad you're here for 10 minutes and you've got it all figured out. And then uh, I also was at Point David when uh, the the Bush one wanted to uh, and coal went there. They wanted to uh, coal went to the US to approve the unification. Uh, there was a little problem with the Polish border. The Germans insisted after the borders were moved after World War II was still under Polish administration rather than Poland problem. And there was a whole hoo-ha on that. But my real question is the alternative for Germany. Of how the hell that got started is because of the lower economic um, standard of living in the East. Is it because they were told all the fascists were in the West? Is it because they they don't see a future for themselves that lots of people just moved west, especially women who could get jobs easier? Uh, I think they are a danger, especially lately in Germany, where they, they had one of the worst people in the world when the election. And they're in Saxony too, which is bigger by two of them. Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. We'd like to take that. John? Uh, well, I think a lot of the conversation has, a, has evolved in this direction that, um, take what Carol said, that, that this struggle for human rights and human dignity never ends. It just changes from generation to generation. And, uh, I think, you know, if you look what happened in this country in the 30s, where um, fascism was on the rise in much of the world, and, and uh, Stalinist communism, and somehow in this country, uh, we rallied uh, uh, the values of, of liberal democracy and constrained capitalism, uh, was something that the American people rallied around, and, and, and were able to be the challenge of that generation. Uh, what was so intoxicating about being in Eastern Europe in those days was that you felt that every story you wrote, every person you met, people were fighting for something really important and noble. And there was a great amount of intellectual ferment about what a society should be, what a government should be, what pluralism meant. And that, that kind of uh, thought about our values and what's important for societies to work is is um, is an ongoing struggle, and I think it's a struggle today. And and, uh, uh, and uh, you have to be able to speak up for what you believe in and defend it, and and that's that's just what we're facing. Amen. <laughs> so, I'd like to thank our audience for coming. Thank you very much for joining us for this discussion. And thank you very much to our distinguished panel. We thought you were all great. You were great for you, Mama. You were great for you. Yes,
As we used to say, it is making the bars open, but it's not really open, it's fresh open. <laughs> 